Hello everyone and welcome to the Gardening 101 program being presented by Regina. Just a reminder that we cannot see or hear you, but if you would like to ask questions, please use the chat box. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. My name is Regina Zolokensky and I do not blame Samantha for not trying that name. It's a pretty tough one. Um, I own Seed Sower Farm LLC, which is a small, um, Mixed, um, in de mixed endeavor. I teach classes on gardening all over Long Island with different um, libraries. I am actually a librarian myself. I started a seed library at Glen Cove Public Library in 2017. Um, and now I am really just a free agent and just doing programs for libraries. I also grow organic vegetables and I have a lot of experience growing. And um, I wanna thank the Middle Country Public Library for letting me offer this presentation. It's very exciting. I, I know we had we came up, um, um, Amber Gagliardi, who is one of the adult librarians there, and I decided that we were getting so many beginner questions at some of the other programs that this might be a good option for new gardeners who might be a little leery, a little afraid, a little tentative about starting a garden. And I'm gonna basically cover some five different vegetables today that you can start now and probably continue now and onwards. And I have that information on the slides. Um, and many of these vegetables are available to you through the Middle Country Public Library. I'm not covering every easy vegetable to grow because it would just be too long of a um, program that way. But uh, we may add those in later on for future programs, depending on how long this goes. So before I get started, I just wanted to let you know, as, as Samantha said, um, your, you can't actually speak directly to me. You can put questions in the chat box. Um, Samantha and I talked about it. I, sometimes I get questions that need clarification of what I've just said. And Samantha is gonna go ahead and interrupt me and as best she can to uh, let me know there's a question to clarify something I've just said. If you have a question about something else, I would suggest holding it to the end because I might cover it in the presentation and or um, it's, it's just going to keep the flow going a little bit better. So in any case, I'm going to get started. So today we're going to talk about quick vegetables, quick and easy vegetables for new gardeners. Um, and here we go. Oops. I always do that. So there are basically five basic gardening requirements. There are many more if you want to really get into it, but this is a beginning class, so I don't want to overwhelm anybody. Uh, the first thing you need to always have is sufficient light. So full sun, contrary to uh, popular belief, is uh, six hours or more a day. It's not blazing sun from morning till night. It's not even direct sun sometimes. Light um, is, is pretty um, a fluid. It's, it's different in, in different areas. And sometimes you'll get six hours a day. Um, you'll get three in the morning, you'll get three in the afternoon, and that's six hours a day. Um, this chart I have here on the right-hand side, I'm going to try to move my little screen up here, um, shows you different plants that you can grow under different lighting conditions. So there are many things you can grow if you're a gardener, if you're a gardener wannabe, and, or you're a gardener, and you just want to try to get more vegetables in around your property, uh, or wherever you're growing, um, that you can grow in three to four hours a day. Generally, these tend to be leafy things. Um, because uh, it takes a lot of energy for the plant to actually produce a fruit. So those fruiting plants or bulbing plants need more than three to four hours a day. They would need four to six hours a day or six to eight hours a day, depending on the plant. So I just like to throw this chart up so you can kind of see there are many, many things you can grow if you don't have, you know, six hours a day. Um, if you like leafy greens and there are, and Full sun, again, is only six to eight hours a day. So the next thing you need is sufficient water. So what does that mean? It really depends on the crop, your soil type, and other factors. So the crop that you grow might be very, um, very greedy about water. So, so things that probably take a lot of water would be things like lettuce, large leaf things things that produce a fruit, when things are fruiting and flowering, that's when you need to be absolutely sure it's watered. 
So for these days we're having today, like today, it's a very hot day. Nobody wants to go outside, but your vegetables and your plants need water more than ever today. So this is the day to go out and water your plants. Um, so sufficient water, again, depends on uh, the crop, your soil type, and other factors. And I'm going to get into a little more detail later on. You need healthy soil. So what you're looking for is soil that's rich in organic matter and free of disease and with minimal weeds. So you need to prepare a good seed bed or a, a garden bed if you're going to plant actual plants instead of seeds. And you need to make sure that there's good organic matter in there. And organic matter is really important because what it does is it, it actually binds nutrients to it. It holds six times its weight in water. And those two things help the plant utilize those, those two really critical things, nutrients and water, when it needs it. The plant can actually pull the water away from the organic matter in the soil. Organic matter, generally the best form you can put into your soil would be compost. Um, you can use leaves, you can do manure, but you need, if you do manure, you need to make sure that it's been uh, composted because manure will actually burn your plants. And it also can harbor some um, pathogens that you don't want to pass on to your crops that you might actually inadvertently uh, introduce to yourself by eating that crop. Um, that's a whole nother program, but generally speaking, if you're going to put manure down, you need to make sure that if it's a ground, if it's a plant that grows under the ground, like a potato, a beet, a radish, a turnip, carrot, you need to make sure you place that manure down on the ground 120 days before you harvest those root vegetables. If it's a, a plant that makes an above ground crop, that would be lettuce or anything leafy or anything like a pepper, a tomato, an eggplant, etc., you need to make sure that you apply that material manure uh, 90 days before you harvest a crop. And these are national organic program guidelines uh, because that is basically what most organic gardeners use. They use manure, they use compost and compost is sometimes made with manure. So those are rules that we follow as organic gardeners to prevent any kind of disease. You need to be on top of your pest issues. Uh, so pest control, uh, organic methods reduce the intake of pesticides into your body. Um, and they can include things like a strong water spray. Um, if you have aphids on your plant, like I saw today, I had some aphids on my poppies. I went ahead and I just sprayed it really with a, with a really strong hose. Now you may have to support the plant. Um, I'm gonna actually put myself back up here because as much as I hate this seeing myself, uh, I realize I, I need to sometimes, it's, explain things by uh, you seeing me. So if you have a plant and it's got aphids on it, you can support the back of the plant with your hand so it doesn't snap the stem and you just spray it really, really closely with a high water spray and that will take care of things like aphids. Um, there are things called exclusion materials. Uh, these would be row cover. Um, I have a little piece of it here. If you're a sewer, if you sew or a seamstress, you will probably say, well, that looks a lot like interfacing. And it, it is pretty similar, except it does let in water and it lets in light. It may reduce light slightly, but it doesn't reduce it dramatically. It's about 85% of light emittance. And that is something that you're going to definitely want to use on things like squash that might have issues with a squash borer. Um, you can... One of the other things in pest control as an organic grower, and this is really my, my, my focus is on organic growing. So that's why you're gonna hear only those kinds of techniques. I believe it's better for the planet and for us, um, is you need to scout. So that means you're gonna go out into your garden and you're gonna look at your plants. You're gonna look on the undersides of the leaves and you're gonna make sure there's nothing funky going on because you're gonna address those issues really early on versus letting them get out of control. Um, and finally, keeping your plants stress-free. And how do you keep your plants stress-free free is making sure they have sufficient water and nutrients, right? So we're going to go back to that. And finally, the most important thing, this what I think is one of the most important things, it should be at the top maybe, is the attention. When you plant something in the garden, it is not set and forget. You have to go and be involved with that plant. You have to make sure it's happy. You have to check on it to make sure it's not being attacked by insects. You need to be intimately involved with your garden so that you know what's going on. Um, and when you do that, just like anything else that you put your effort and attention on, it's going to come out better than if you don't. If you just start something and walk away from it, it's not likely to be successful. 
same is true of gardening. I did that other thing. So today I'm going to cover those basics. I'm going to talk about um, those different vegetables that you can still start now. There are still many things you can put in the ground, including peppers, tomatoes, and eggplants, if you're so inclined. Don't be surprised that you will get a smaller crop, but you will get a crop. Um, but you know, this May 15th Mother's Day deadline is just a very false deadline. I think it's the, I think it's the Mother's Day uh, thing they get that trying to get people to go out and spend all their money by Mother's Day. But you can still grow many things, including these five vegetables I'll talk about today. Arugula, beets, cucumbers, lettuce, summer squash, and zucchini. And summer squash and zucchini are sometimes interchangeably uh, referred to, but zucchini is a different uh, variety of squash altogether. It is a squash, but it's not a, it's a but zucchini. Summer squash can be, zucchini can be a summer squash, but summer squash can't be a zucchini. Let's just put it that way. And there are others you can try. There are things like beans and peas and salad turnips. Very, very easy to grow. I'm not going to talk about those today because I'm trying to keep this simple and down to five ve ve basic vegetables. I'm going to share with you at the end some resources where you can read about anything that you want to grow. But as I said, if you are passing a farm stand and you've always wanted to grow cherry tomatoes, you can still get cherry tomatoes in the ground. You can still get regular tomatoes in the ground. Just make sure that the maturity date isn't very long. So what do I mean by that? 60, 70 days to maturity usually it's gonna give you a crop before we get our first frost. We have a very long growing season here in Long Island. We have 190 days of growing season, which is really, really great. And generally speaking, we don't get a frost before a, uh, October 15th. And that seems to be pushed further and further uh, into uh, November now. So the first one I wanna talk about is arugula. Arugula is a really nice leafy crop. This is one of those crops you can grow in a little bit of sun. You don't need full, full sun. It does uh, do well in full sun, but it will also do well in part sun. Um, if you're growing arugula from seed, you'll want to plant about five seeds to an inch, about and and in rows about two feet apart, um, two inches apart. I'm sorry. Now, so why do you need to be sure your spacing is correct? Is because the soil only has so much capacity to support that plant. You know, the plant is going to do a lot on its own with the photosynthesis of the sun but it's still gonna need nutrients from the soil to help move all of those nutrients up to the leaves for it, the leaves to do what they need to do. So you can actually grow arugula anywhere from a month before our first frost, uh, from early spring up until a month before our first frost. Our first frost, as I mentioned before, is October 15th. If you want arugula all season, you need to plant it every two days, every two weeks for a continuous harvest. So um, sometimes people say to me, oh, I would love to grow cilantro, but it, it always goes to seed. It's always bolts so fast. Cilantro is one of those things you'll want to grow from seed. You'll never want to buy a plant because it doesn't like its roots disturbed. Same thing is true with arugula. So when you plant things directly in the ground, like seeds, and when there's so many, it's only so many days to maturity, 40 days to maturity from arugula, for arugula, it doesn't pay to start it in a pack and then plant it. It's just better to direct seed it. You would have to thin them to be um, about two inches apart and you will harvest those plants and you'll, oh, if you wanna continue to supply, you have to plant it every two weeks. So as I said, it, it prefers fertile well-drained soil with an average pH between six and 6.8 and it does well in full to part shade sun. So pH, I'm not really gonna get into giant detail about it, but since I'm talking about it now, I knew this would happen. I would think of other things to say. Um, pH is really the acidity of your soil. And on Long Island, we have a general acidity of a between six, between six and seven. So generally speaking, without even touching your soil, without even amending it, making it more acidic or less acidic, it's generally semi, slightly acidic, which is perfect for vegetable growing. Pests that you might encounter with arugula might be the flea beetle. And here's a picture of flea beetles on the right-hand side. You can see the leaf itself looks like it's kind of been sandblasted, shot with like shot, uh, shots of something and it's got lots of holes in it. Well, that doesn't help the plant do great photosynthesis. So the plant's gonna suffer and, and die. It'll be under stress and it will die. This happens to be an eggplant leaf that you're looking at, but it's the same situation. 
These flea beetles are tiny. They look like fleas. That's how small they are, but they're beetles. Um, so the best thing you can do with, with flea beetles is really to use row cover. Um, that's what we just talked about before, this stuff, if you have a big problem. Um, but I really feel too that they show up when the conditions are very dry. I really don't ever have a problem with flea beetles on arugula at all. This was just something that I researched and found is could be a problem. Um, and you'll know you have a problem when you see those small rounded irregular holes and um, you really need to either cover them with row cover, get them off first. Of course, you don't wanna tuck them underneath that row cover and have them have no um, problems with the sun or anything. So you'll have to cover them and um, hopefully that'll improve. Now, we're not gonna talk about eggplant today, but eggplants tend to do better if you put them in as larger plants. These flea beetles really like succulent young growth. So um, if you're having issues with flea beetles and eggplants, my suggestion to you is to make sure the plant has plenty of water and it is not stressed. But also when you plant your eggplant, wait till it's big enough to withstand this kind of uh, onslaught. When you harvest arugula, you can either do one of three things. You can either cut it, um, you can either just use thinnings uh, from the ground, because uh, you'll definitely want to be thinning your plants so they have enough space. You can cut them about an inch above the um, top of the plant so that you're not cutting off the growing point of the plants. Or you can pull the whole plant and just cut the roots off and wash the leaves and eat it like that. Um, oh, the last state to plant. I didn't put that up there. Oh my goodness, I don't think I did that on any of these. So like I said, the last state to plant would be uh, about a month before first frost. My goodness, I hope I didn't do that on all of these. So beets, oh no, I didn't, good. Okay, so beets, beets are a great plant to grow. It's, it's a twofer plant because not only do you get a root, uh, the root of the beet, which is really nutritious, uh, but you also get the leaves. And the leaves are very similar to Swiss chard or chard, if you, Call a chard or Swiss chard, they're both this, they're both correct. Um, and when you grow one thing like this and you get two crops, that's terrific. I actually harvested some beets today. They're just beautiful. I'm really impressed with them this year. Um, I did a good job. Sometimes I don't do such a good job, but I did a great job. And uh, I'm bringing those to my mom tomorrow and she'll enjoy both the leaves and the roots. So beets can be one of those cool weather crops. And a lot of these things, that's why you're seeing, you can plant them late because we're, we have, we kind of have the cool season at the beginning of the, of the season growing and then it cools down at the end. So you kind of have two windows to grow cool season crops if you can time it right. So for beets, you're gonna grow, you're gonna sow about 15 seeds per foot. You know, just generally estimate, you don't need to count every seed. Uh, about a half inch deep, and you're gonna make the rows about 12 to 18 inches apart. When they start to emerge, um, after they put up their second set of leaves, because the first set of leaves will be just a very generic looking leaf, um, you're gonna wait till they get a little larger, you're gonna thin them to two inches apart, which is really, you can get a lot of beets in a row. If you think about a four foot row, that would probably be, well, that's six times four, that's like 24 beets, and that's a lot of beets. Um, so for a continuous supply of the greens or the beets themselves, you'll want to sow them at two week intervals until eight weeks before the first heavy frosts are expected. So that would be like August 15th, right? Beets prefer loamy soil and definition of loam. And I had to look this up because I'm like, oh, I've seen that word, but I never knew what it really meant um, myself. And I've been growing for a very long time is really, it's uh, loam is really soil composed. It's mostly sand, silt, and a small amount of clay. They don't really like heavy soils. Um, as you would imagine, a root has to kind of push itself out in a heavy soil, it might be harder to do. The problem with beets that you'll find is something called meat, leaf miner. And this picture on the right-hand side, you can see has this very irregular pattern of um, damage to the leaves. Again, that's going to be a problem for you to develop a root because the plant has to photosynthesize. And what it does is it takes all that energy it gets from the sun and it sends it down to its root. That's basically a carbohydrate storage organ. So you're eating the, the organ that will support the plant, but it gets its, its, its energy from the leaves. So if the leaves are damaged like this, it's not going to uh, do so well and you're not gonna get a good size beet. 
So how do you deal with this? This is the problem. It's a very big problem this year for me. I'm not sure it's because we had a while, a, um, a milder winter, but it tends to, um, it, it seems like it's pretty bad. So what it basically is, and I don't think I have a picture. Oh, that's too bad. It's a little fly and it lays its egg on the, on the leaf of the beet. It'll do this to chard. It'll do this to um, other things like chard, um, beets, other plants. I've never really seen it on anything but beets and chard. And chard, if you didn't know, is just basically a beet plant that is bred to develop leaves versus a root. Same family. What it does then is that leaf miner egg hatches. The, the, the larva burrows in between the leaf the two um, between the leaf um, ends, right? So it's, it's actually very small, but it eats out the inside of the leaf. What'll happen after it's done that and it's gotten large enough, it'll drop into the ground and it will just lay there. It'll, re it'll develop to become a full size fly again and it'll come up and it'll start the process again. So when you see this kind of damage, your best bet your only bet really is to pull those leaves off, even if they're big leaves and it's heartbreaking, but you break those leaves off the plant, you throw them in a plastic bag and you throw them in the garbage. You don't drop them on the ground. You don't put them in the compost because the, that larva is just gonna, it, it's just going to pupate and it's going to come up and land on your plants again. So when you wanna harvest beets, you pull the whole plant. You can use the thinnings as greens uh, and uh, the tops, as I mentioned, are edible too. And the last date you can plant beets from seed would be August 15th. Now you could certainly also plant beets from transplant. I, that's my preference. Um, I start them in seed packs, one seed per cell. And once they get to a decent size, about maybe two inches, I transplant them into the ground. Um, and that way I have more control over the spacing. I also have some bunnies. So they always tend to get everything a little bit before I do. So I, I have a little more control that way. Um, the problem when you transplant is you set things back two weeks. So even though you think you're ahead of the game because you started the plants early, you actually don't gain any time. You actually get a little more convenience. You get a little more control of the spacing and you don't have to go back and thin, but you actually lose about two weeks because the plant is trying to now rebound from having its roots disturbed. We do have a question in the chat. We actually have two questions. One of them is about thinning the plants though. They were wondering if you can go over that a little more. What exactly is thinning the plants? So thinning is very simply just taking out the, 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 the so if you have to plant something two inches apart and you have 20 plants in between those two other plants, you pull out those 20 plants. It's kind of sad. It's kind of what you have to do. If you want beets or beet greens it's you know you need to take do that the same is true with um carrots you have to thin them you have to actually pull out perfectly good plants to give the spacing to the plant that it needs so in this case you can eat the thinnings you can just pull them out cut the roots off throw it in water have it in a salad saute it up if you have enough um but you, that's what thinning is it's literally thinning thinning the herd more or less you're taking, uh, you're looking at your plants. I always try to pick the plants that look strongest and I start from there. This is the plant. There's a bunch of little plants here. This is the next plant two inches away. Pull out everything in between. And you can't really, you could try to transplant beets because you can transplant beets, but you would never do that with carrots. Uh, they just don't transplant well. How is that, good? Well, if they have any more questions, I will let you know. Sure. The other question was in regards to cabbage plants. I'm not sure if you're going to go over that more later or if you'd like me to read the question now. I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about cap, cabbage plants today. Um, they're a little bit, they need a little more TLC than an easy and quick vegetable. But if you want to hold the question to the end, I'd be happy to answer it at the end. Sounds good. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. So. Um, we did beets. So now we're on to cucumbers. Well, cucumbers are fabulous. And I happen to be one of those people that doesn't eat a cucumber all year until they're in locally, because there's nothing like a, a local, freshly picked cucumber. They're nothing like what you get in the store. They have incredible sweetness. You almost think you're eating watermelon. That's how sweet they can be. So uh, cucumbers are really easy to direct sow if you want to transplant them, because again, you're, you want to deal with spacing more efficiently. You want to make sure everything germinates. Uh, you can certainly do that. And again, you put one seed per cell, 
once they get their true leaves, their true set of leaves, because every plant is going to have something called a cotyledon. It basically is just a couple of leaves that get that plant started to start to photosynthesize. Um, but the true leaves are always different looking. And you know what a cucumber plant leaf looks like. It sort of almost looks like a, almost like a maple leaf, but not a maple leaf. It's kind of hairy. Um, I wish I had a picture of it, but I don't. So you can direct sow or transplant your cucumbers when all danger of frost has passed. Cucumbers do not like cold weather. I would never plant my cucumbers in May, even though the frost has passed. The, the soil has to be warm for them to germinate. Otherwise, they'll just rot. And a tip would be, well, you know, if you planted a cucumber last year and some of the cucumbers fell to the ground and rotted, no cucumbers are coming up this year, which means they just don't like cold soil. So warm soil is the best. I usually start mine as transplants and I do that about two weeks before the last frost. But this is something you can still do up until August 1st. You can still plant cucumbers and get a crop uh, up until August 1st. And you can start from seed. Um, it, uh, cucumbers really need warm, well-drained soil, high in fertility. Again, that pH is about six to six, eight. So we're really right in that zone here on Long Island. They need consistent, adequate in irrigation. They make a very water, you know, water intensive fruit, right? Think about a cucumber. A cucumber is basically water. It's just encased by the skin. It's very uh, refreshing. So it needs a lot of water. Um, so you need to make sure that you are consistently watering. And I guess this is a good time to talk about watering. I did, I'm not going into those very specific things. I'm talking more about crops that you can grow as a new gardener that are very quick to grow and easy to grow. But water is really something that you need to talk about in terms of how you water, when you water. So a lot of people have irrigation systems um now these days and they're great to some degree i mean someday i would love one for my 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 woody plants out front all of my you know my lawn and my shrubs but as far as vegetables go it's really better not to have irrigation systems shoot on every day for 20 minutes at a very superficial level it's better to water your plants deeply in the water in the morning on the base of the plant not on the leaves and do it um two or three times a week. I mean, in extremely hot weather, you might have to do it every day. But when you, when you have a, a sprinkler system that goes on for 20 minutes a day, it's really, a lot of that water is not even getting to the root zone. It's gonna get, it's gonna, it's gonna probably get to the top inch or something of the soil. It will probably penetrate that far. And then a lot of it evaporates just because it's flying through the air. So water is really important. Now, um, there are many ways you can gauge how much water your plants are getting. You could get a rain gauge. They're very cheap. You just Google online, okay, Google rain gauge. They're cheap plastic things that you don't spend a lot of money on, nothing fancy. You have this incredible uh, tool that we are all born with. It's your finger. You can stick your finger in the soil and see if it feels moist uh, or if it's socky wet. You don't want that either because plants need Plant roots actually need oxygen as well as water, right? They, uh, they need air and oxygen to be able to have an exchange of the nutrients and gases that occur under the ground. So watering is important. Consistent, adequate irrigation is important for everything, especially for a crop like cucumbers. Pests. Oh, and you need to grow cucumbers on a trellis. Now, pe people don't, and you don't have to. But this is something you should know about plants in general as well. When you grow uh, something like a cucumber on the ground, those cucumbers are really hard to find. So what'll happen is it'll get better. A cucumber could get, you know, and maybe it's a curvy that you're supposed to pick and that's supposed to be like this. And it, even lower the size to pick it, it's, it's gonna be about, you know, it's gonna be filled out enough, but not super fat and not white. Cause when they start to get like really fat, that means the seeds inside that cucumber are maturing. Once the plant senses that, that has, it has a mature fruit out there, it's gonna stop making flowers because the reason that plant is making those vegetables isn't for us to enjoy a, a fabulous salad or eat some great vegetables. It's to get its seed into the future. Now, cucumbers are never gonna survive into the future, but they, they, don't, they, you know, they don't know that. So basically you need to make sure you find every single cucumber and pick it. So when you have a trellis, when you have a trellis and you're growing these up, and it can be as simple as two stakes, really tall stakes in the ground, or a couple of bamboo poles attached to a metal stake, 
really tall and just some string going back and forth. It does not have to be fancy. Once you get your cucumbers to start train, training up, they have tendrils and they will pull, pull themselves up. And it's the best way to grow, not only because you want to find every cucumber, you don't want it to go, uh, you don't want a cucumber to go too far into maturity and the plant will stop producing, but also because of an airflow. Cucumbers have big leaves. Um, you're watering them a lot. Around August, you're always going to see a little powdery mildew on them. Powdery mildew is a problem um, on most things like squash and cucumbers, big leaf things like that. Um, and that will reduce the ability of the plant to photosynthesize. And it needs to photosynthesize to be able to make more fruit. I mean, it's a, it's a dual thing. It's above, it's the sun that it gets, as well as the soil that it gets the nutrients from. Cucumbers actually do pretty well in part sun. I can guarantee you that. You may not get a bumper crop, but you will get cucumbers. If you're, you need a cucumber a week, you can probably pull it off in part sun. So that's that. So what are the pests? The pests we have for cucumbers are, are really this one, the cucumber beetle, the striped or the spotted one. Uh, they're really, really fast movers. Uh, so it's gonna be fun to try to catch them. Uh, you'll see on the, so the picture of them is there. I mean, there are other ones out there, but these are the most common ones we see on Long Island. They, they have other colored ones. Now, don't kill ladybugs. That's not a squash beetle. That's not a cucumber beetle. But you can see the picture here on the bottom, underneath those insects, how the cucumber leaf looks. Um, they attack other things too. They'll attack um, squash. They seem to really love tomatillos. I noticed that the other day. They're, they're congregating on my tomatillos, which is good because it's sort of like a trap crop. I'm going to go over there and find them and get them before they go over and find my cucumbers because I want my cucumbers to produce. With all these holes in there, they're not going to produce. There's no way in the world that plant's going to have the energy to be able to make a cucumber or any cucumber, much less more than one. So um, the best way to deal with these is to really sc scout them. You need to either um, find them and grab them and squish them. You can um, have a bucket of water with a drop of soap in it. Uh, and you can kind of tap the plant and they'll drop into that hopefully. And then they can't fly out because this, there's this thing called surface tension. It's a physical, it's a physics property that that soap prevents them from being able to lift up out of that water. Um, you can use yellow sticky traps. Um, they're very attracted to yellow insects, all insects are, which is one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of yellow sticky traps. But if you have a really big problem with cucumber beetles and you're willing to sacrifice some other good bugs in the process, and that's your only option, then that's what you need to do. So you can see how the leaves look brown and wilted. It, they almost look like they don't have enough water, like the plants are drying out. And it's because they're eating uh, all of that um, green light, green, green material. And what you need to also do is the, you can see these two insects are probably mating. You need to look on the undersides of your plants to see if there are any eggs under there. Now, I don't have pictures of the eggs, but you can Google cucumber eggs, cucumber beetle eggs, and you will find something. I, I just always um, like to tell people to use sites that are ending with an EDU, an extension unit, you know, like a Cornell Cooperative Extension has images. Um, any kind of educational site, um, like, you know, like a, a, um, Cornell University or University of Pennsylvania or, um, oh, there's so many um, different, or, uh, you know, Rutgers. Those are the sites you want to look at to identify issues and insects. When you go online and you Google things, people put things up that are completely incorrect. So you need to make sure you're using a, a, a really good site. Okay. So um, that's what you can do with cucumber beetle. They really need to be smushed. There's really not out. I mean, there are organic sprays and stuff out there, but I'm not a user of them. I personally wouldn't use anything like rotenone. Rotenone is an organic insecticide, but it's broad spectrum. So what does that mean? That means it's going to kill everything. So it's going to kill your good insects as well as your bad insects. And I do a whole class on insect identification, which is why I'm not going into too much detail here. Um, I do a whole class on that and um, I go into all the different cycles and stages and um, how to identify what's what, but this is what you need to do. You need to go out, look at your plants, see what they look like. If they're not looking good, you have to look for these little guys and you got to get rid of them. And that's that. 
Um, you can harvest your fruit continuously while they're small to ensure continuous production. As I mentioned, if it gets, if a cucumber gets too big, the plant's gonna say, hey, I'm done. I got my seed out there. I'm finished. I'm, I'm on vacation. I'm not gonna make any more flowers. Does it need to? And the last date to plant cucumbers is August 1st. I bet a lot of people are surprised to hear that. We actually do have a question in the chat. They, um, Elizabeth is just wondering if there is an app or, reset, uh, or resource to use to identify pest, mildew, et cetera, and suggest how to treat the plant organically to rid of the problem. So there are apps out there on insect identification. You have to pay for all of them. Um, I don't know how good they are because I've not used them. Um, but I think it's just a matter of, you know, you know, if, if you can just get to your phone, your phone has internet, you can just go on to a, a Cornell site or, a, you know, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania or Rutgers, you're going to find information. As far as organic uh, control, this is really the best way to go. I mean, there may be sprays out there. I'm not familiar with those. If there are, um, I imagine row cover would also help um, to keep them from getting onto your plants if you have a big problem. But um, I would just go with those sites. I mean, you can go on an app. How good they are, I don't know. I mean, I don't really use apps like that because I, I have found, you know, that plant ID, that insect ID, you take a picture of it, it gives you a, a name of what it is. And it's like, that's not what that is. So I would just recommend using Cornell's, Cornell Cooperative Extension, Rutgers University, University of Pennsylvania. And they do often have organic uh, options out there. Okay. All right, lettuce. So lettuce is really, really simple to grow. Uh, believe it or not, it's a pretty heavy feeder. It actually feeds, it really takes a lot of energy out of the soil. So you really need to make sure you have good soil for growing this. So how do you plant lettuce? You can direct sow it or transplant it. Again, I'm a big transplanter because the seeds are kind of small. You waste a lot of seed when you direct sow. But you know, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. If you're really good at spacing your seed when you drop it, that's terrific. I never have the time. I'm like a quick sower. I'm too quick, probably. Um, so you need to plant in early spring, as soon as the soil can be worked. So that's like really early spring. You know, that could be March. As long as the soil isn't wet, and you can hold. It. So a good way to know whether your soil is not too wet from snow or whatever the season brought. Um, is to take a clump of soil in your hand, you make a ball, you make a fist, you open it up, right? And then you touch it. If it falls apart, it's, it's, it's good to work. If it's in a clump still and it's really not breaking apart, it's still too wet. It's too cold, it's too wet. Um, so you can start in early spring as soon as, as soon as the soil can be worked. And you can sow every two to three weeks for continuous harvest of either full heads or, or salad mix. Now you could harvest your, your lettuce by taking leaves off the bottom of the plant. Like you know how celery is like a stalk and you pull off those outer leaves. That's how you'd harvest your lettuce. Um, you can do that and that will keep it somewhat in a state of uh, weakness that it won't go to seed, right? When, when, when things go to seed, we call that bolting. And that's basically the plant trying to get its seed out into the future. Well, that's not a bad thing, especially for lettuce. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, it, likes, it likes warm, not really warm temperatures, seven degree temperatures to germinate. So it's a little trickier to get going in the really hot summer. So in the depths of summer, um, you might want to do it in a tray and then transplant it out because you could probably start those seeds, put them in the basement, wait till they germinate someplace cool because 70 degrees is kind of cool for the summer. You know, we're talking about 80 degrees. Now that's air temperature, but the soil can get very warm too. Um, so you can start, start it that way and in the depths of summer and transplant them out. Or if you're going to direct sow, just make sure you water that soil every day. When you water the soil, what happens is you're, you're lowering the temperature. It's like having a shower, you know, like I had like three showers today because we don't have the air conditioning on and I'm just, you know, it's hot. I got to have a shower. I'm going to cool off. So the same is true when you water your soil you're cooling the temperature of the soil down and that's beneficial for helping things germinate. What are your pests? Your pests are generally bunnies. They are my biggest problem. Uh, as my husband likes to say, they're rabbits. They're not bunnies. Uh, slugs and other 
things like deer if you have them. So fencing will keep out bunnies. Slugs can be controlled by encircling your lettuce plants with a little sand or wood ash. So basically, and there's also diatomaceous earth, which is expensive. Um, diatomaceous earth is a very, is a very, is a type of soil. It's not soil, they call it diatomaceous earth. It's like a, um, it's almost like a mineral, I think. And basically what happens is it's got very sharp, microscopically, you would never see this by looking at it, but very sharp edges. So slugs who are very soft bodied, they don't like to crawl over that stuff. So what works just as well is this uh, wood ash because it's kind of gritty. They don't like it, sand. Of course, you'd have to reapply it after, um, after um, a rain. So if, if that's a problem, you could try that. You could also try the beer bowl thing for the slugs. It's kind of cruel. You know, the, the, the slugs aren't really getting a, having a party and having a good time with the bud, you know, they're literally going to just explode. So I, I don't like doing that. It's just too gross to me. So that's how you can control these things. Uh, if you have deer, you may really have to think about deer fencing. I mean, we're all dealing with deer these days. I have deer. We saw deer. Somebody saw deer in Huntington Station and it's such a built up area. And it's just unbelievable because they're all being displaced by all the building that's happening. Um, fencing, three foot fencing is perfectly good. If you can raise, if you can plant in a raised bed, that's even better. And I think that, you know, you might still, you might still have a little problems with slugs, but probably less problems. Um, and as far as harvesting, like I said, you can individual leaves or entire heads. You can um, make, you, there are different kinds of lettuces out there. There's mescaline lettuce, which is basically baby lettuces that you harvest. And you can harvest that up to three times, right? So you cut it about when it's about three inches tall, um, about, you know, an inch from the top of, from the bottom of the plant, because your growing point for lettuce is always at the center. You can almost see that in one of these images that there's, there's a little bit of, a, um, you, can't, you can't see what I'm doing. I'm pointing to something you can't see it. Um, on that bottom, in the middle screen, on that bottom lettuce, you can almost see the new growth is in the center. So you don't wanna cut too, too, too short because otherwise you're cutting off the growing point of your plants. All right, so you cut them when they're about three inches tall for two more cuttings, so it'll come back. The third cutting is never going to be as nice as the first or second cutting, but you'll still get three cuttings if you're doing a mescaline mix. So the last day to plant a lettuce is be for baby lettuces, be September 20th, um, which is pretty far away. So you could be planting like, a, you know, if you love lettuce, this is the time to do it. And if you're an organic eater, you may notice lettuce is not cheap. You know, I go into the grocery store in the winter and I'm almost like, I'm almost going to fall over when I see that a head of lettuce is four dollars. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But that's what we pay for in the winter. If you want to eat things out of season, that's what you do. But to grow your own organic lettuce, you'll save a lot of money. Seed is very inexpensive. And your seed library has these lettuces. So uh, full size head, you need to have planted the seed by August 20th. Why? Well, because, you know, the plant's got to get bigger and you need to give it the time it needs until we get that first frost. And that's always a tricky kind of thing too, because um, we have uh, October 15th is our first frost date, but it, that's always like variable. It's an estimate, you know, it could be earlier, it could be later, but you need to also account for cooler days. Days are not warming up like they do in the spring. Things get warmer as we move into summer. In the fall, things are getting cooler. So you're changing, you're dealing with less light, the sun is also a little, there's less daylight during uh, the spring, during the, the um, fall. We, you know, we, we have spring equinox uh, around April 20th, um, March 20th, uh, and it just keeps getting lighter and lighter longer. Uh, and it's exactly the opposite when you're planting for the fall. So bear that in mind. So as my husband would say, your mileage may vary. Okay, I'm going to try to move myself out of here. because I really we actually do have just one more question. Sure. About, um, so do you take off the row cover for the bees to pollinate or do you, ha uh, do you hand pollinate? Okay, what are we talking about? Lettuce? It was axed around lettuce. So I'm assuming it goes okay. towards so lettuce. So lettuce doesn't really need to be pollinated. You're eating the leaves. At the, when the lettuce does need to be pollinated or if you want to let it go to seed, and I would recommend you to do that, if it starts to bolt and that, so bolting is basically, you'll know it's happening because the plant is going to start to elongate. 
because it's going to send up a flower shoot. Let it go. The pollinators will have their way. They'll get some nectar. They'll get some pollen. You'll make some seed. You can save that seed. You can let that seed fall. And then the next spring, you might have some lettuce because lettuce will overwinter. It will, it will real volunteer. It's called volunteering where you find stuff that you planted last year are now growing everywhere in your garden and you didn't plant it. Um, but no, lettuce doesn't need to be pollinated. If you're talking about things like squash, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, you would not leave the row cover on beyond the point of flowering. But lettuce isn't going to flower until it's not edible anymore. So uh, you don't need to put row cover on lettuce, although lettuce does well with row cover. And that's what I'm actually using right now to kind of keep the bunnies at bay. I have hoops and I, 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 I'm I sorry to say, there's not a great resource for the hoops. You can make your own and I'll explain that in a minute. But um, I have hoops, I have my row cover over it. And then I, I basically, uh, put, I, I bring it down very tight to the bottom of the ground and I close pins along my hoops. And I, maybe I'll throw a board down too to keep the bunnies from getting underneath it. They generally don't, they, they're, not, they're not that ambitious. If there's, a, if there's a, um, some kind of an obstacle, they're not gonna really try to get past it unless it's a fence they can go through. Um, so that's what I'm using for lettuce. And it does, it does make for a nicer head of lettuce. So you could leave it on all the whole time for lettuce. But so she's actually, sorry, she's asking yeah. about cucumbers and row, co uh, and row covers. Cucumbers, you wouldn't really use row cover unless you're growing it on the ground. You can't really do a row cover on a, on a trellis. Um, and yeah, you would have to take it off to, for it to be pollinated because cucumbers, zucchini, once it starts flowering, you'll take it off on anything because things like cucumbers, zucchini, watermelon, um, melons, there's other things. Uh, need to be pollinated by pollinators. They need insect pollination. So you need to take that off. I just took the row cover off of my zucchini today. And I'll talk about that in a second anyway. Um, but I was just gonna say about the slugs. So I've got the row cover on my, my um, lettuces and other greens that I know the bunnies are just gonna have a field day with. Um, and I noticed that some of my lettuce does have some slug damage. You know, is that going to bother me? As long as I'm not eating a slimy slug, I'm okay with it. But, you know, if you were trying to grow a perfect head of lettuce, you need to definitely stay on top of the slugs. And you're going to do that by encircling your, your plants with that gritty kind of material. Go to the beach. We have beaches all over Long Island. Just get a couple of, you know, buckets of sand. And just keep reapplying it. That's going to do the job. Okay, so zucchini. So zucchini or summer squash, as we talked about before, is really a very easy, wonderful thing to grow. It's almost too easy to grow. Um, maybe you've been the recipient of a, uh, a zucchini or two that you didn't ask for because there comes a point when everyone's growing zucchini at the same time and we all wind up uh, trying to find homes for our zucchini. Um, so again, this is one of those plants that really needs warm temperatures to thrive. If you plant it too soon, the seeds will rot. Um, so you need to sow, direct sow, or you can do, again, you can do transplants um, after all danger of frost. So the technique, and I have to turn this back on so I can see that you can see what I'm talking about. The technique to plant zucchini or summer squash is something called the hell method. And basically what that is, is you're going to take a uh, your soil and you're gonna kind of mound it up, right? It's not a giant hill, it's just a little bit of elevated soil. And it's probably gonna be, you know, a good, I don't know, foot, two feet, foot and a half, two feet in diameter. And along in that two feet diameter, um, is that right? Yeah, diameter, radius, I can't remember math. Anyway, uh, you're gonna poke five to seven seeds in, right? Five seeds is good. Five seeds, about an inch deep. And then you're gonna wait. They're gonna start to germinate. Once they germinate and come up, you're gonna let them get to you know, a decent size plant. Um, and you're going to then pull out to three of those, two of those plants. You're gonna make it thin it to three. Well, why do we need three? Well, because zucchini is one of those plants that needs to be pollinated by insects and you need male flowers and female flowers around at the same time. So by having three plants planted in this hill, you're increasing the opportunity for the, zoo, for the, for the insect, 
the bee, the bumblebee, the honeybee, whatever it is that's coming over and pollinating it to move from plant to plant very efficiently and do some efficient pollination. Now, as soon as your plants have gotten to the point where they're growing and they're up, well, I would probably put the row cover on right at the beginning. I plant the seeds in the soil. I put the row cover on to, at the very beginning. And the reason why is there's a problem with this insect called the squash vine borer. I'm gonna knock myself out again so you can see. So this is an insect that actually comes out at night. Um, this, you would never know that that is what it, that is, but that's the adults right there on the left, um, at the upper upper left, that um, will come and it'll, it'll lay its, it'll try to lay its egg in this, the very tender stem of the zucchini or the summer squash. It'll lay, it'll get its ovipositor in, it'll lay an egg in the stem, and then what happens is that egg will hatch and it will start to, it'll become an, a larva, which is the active feeding stage of any insect. It's uh, one of the stages of development of this particular insect. And it's gonna eat out the whole inside of your zucchini stem. Now, what's happening there? It's just, it's destroying the plant's ability to send nutrients up to the leaves. You'll sometimes see wilted leaves. You'll be like, I'm not watering enough. You are watering enough probably. Cause if you see all this yellow stuff, I'll buy your stems, you know you've got the squash wine borer. So when you keep that row cover on those plants for until they start to flower, I mean, you can pull, you can take it off and pull out those two plants when you think that they're sized up enough. And I usually wait till they're a good size because I really want these plants to be established before I start eradicating what might be, you know, my best plants, right? You wanna pick out the, leave the three strongest plants you're gonna pull out the other two. You might be able to transplant them. I don't know, it might, might be tricky. Um, keep that row cover on that plant until those plants are pushing up against that row cover and are flowering. I just took my row cover off today because my plants are starting to flower. So I wanna make sure that those pollinators are gonna get by and, and pollinate my plant. Otherwise there's no point in growing zucchini and I am not hand pollinating. That is just, that's just, no, we don't need to do that yet. We keep our insect population uh, healthy and strong. Our pollinators happy. We should never have to do that because that would not be, uh, food would get very expensive if that's the case because we need pollinators for all those things I talked about before. So that's how you deal with the squash vine borer. Now, um, if you happen to get, okay, so again, we're gonna go out and we're gonna scout. If say you're in, you're in the garden, oh, well, this, no, this is a different story. Okay, so that's the squash vine borer. I'll talk about the squash bug next. The squash bug is the insect that's going to lay eggs under the undersides of the leaves. Um, that will destroy your plant by eating the leaves, which is what the plant needs to get the energy from the sun to make that fruit, right? To make that fruit and flowering. Um, so what you need to do is simply look underneath the leaves. You're gonna scout, you're gonna look at your plants and you're gonna squash those eggs. It's the easiest way to kill any insect is in the egg stage. Now, say you have a vine, let's go back to the squash vine borer. Say you have a squash vine borer and he's in there and you know you got a problem. Um, you can try to do this one thing they say to try to do is you cut the stem open, you scoop out that borer, get that thing out of there, and then you can bury the stem. And then the chances are good, not great, that the plant will now make new roots and regenerate itself and be able to continue its production. When you wanna harvest zucchini, you need to harvest it regularly. Please don't be the person who plants the zucchini and disappears for a week. Because what happens then is the zucchinis get to be like weapons. They become like clubs. And when it's that big, it's also not, it's not such great eating first and foremost. And I defy you to find recipes that will deal with two pounds, three pounds, four pounds of zucchini. <laughs> but the second problem is, as we talked before about the cucumbers, once the plant gets that big of a, a fruit out there, it's done its job. It's gone ahead and it's made a, a mature fruit that's got viable seed in it and it doesn't have to do another, doesn't have to make another flower. It's done, it's quits, calling it quits. So you need to harvest your zucchini regularly. It's really delicious, very small. I mean, I work for a farmer, an organic farmer at a farmer's market. And he sells the baby zucchinis for a top dollar because people love them. They love just getting little zucchinis and sauteing them up in the pan. So you can pick it at any size you want. 
Um, so when you harvest it, you need to be very careful that you pull off the, the stem. You can, I, I like to cut them. That's what I do. I don't like to twist. I, I think that's a good way to screw up the stem. Um, and then you're going to um, basically pick them when they're about six to eight inches long and try to avoid, be very gentle with that because it's very tender skin on summer squash and zucchini. They're easily scratched. The last day you can plant zucchini. We're coming up to it, believe it or not. I know we feel like we're far away, but we are literally about a month away from the last time you can plant zucchini and expect to get a crop. There was something else I was gonna say about zucchini and I've just forgotten what it was. But um, so that row cover, and I'm gonna go into the screen next that will show you a little more detail, is this stuff, right? Make sure I'm gonna make sure you can see what I'm doing here. I'm gonna click here again. Oh, that went too far. Okay, so this is that row cover. You're basically going to put it over your plants and you're gonna keep it in place. You can weigh it down with rocks if you want, but try to have some kind of a structure over it so it's not laying on the plant. Water will go through this. Light will go through this. It'll be enough for your zucchini. Once your plants are pushing up against it and they're flowering, you can take it off. Because now at this point, the squash vine borer can't get its ovipositor into that stem. That stem is basically lignified, which basically means it's gotten more woody. So it just doesn't have the oomph, literally the oomph to get the ovipositor in. Did I cover everything here? I did. Okay. So we talked about this fabric. They sell this at Home Depot for $14.99. I think it's like a 25 feet, it's cheap. And you can reuse it if you're careful and you don't rip it like I do, but you can reuse it. Uh, oh yeah, six, six by 25 feet for 15 bucks. It's well worth it because you will not have the problem with, the, with that squash vine borer if you use this. And I know I, one year I worked as a farmer and when I tell you we planted 100 feet rows of zucchini, which is quite a lot of zucchini and had to put structure up all down that row, I was like miserable. It was a whole day job, but we harvested off of that first set of zucchini plants for over two months. It was ridiculous how well it works. And I, I became a convert after that. So you can make these hoops and um, it's really just a hoop. It's just literally... I don't have anything to show you. I have hoops in my garden, but I don't want to drag the thing out there. It's literally just a hoop. It's like a, um, it's like a, it almost looks like half a hula hoop, which would work. Um, like you would just stick that into the ground and then just lay the row cover over it. And you can either pin it down with pins if you want. You can just use clothes pins at the bottom to keep the insect out. You put rocks on the bottom, whatever holds it down on top of that plant until it can get to the point where it's flowering. Some people use rebar, they get two feet pieces of rebar and they sink that into the ground. And then they get PVC, a flexible v PVC. I think it's like half inch or quarter inch, probably half inch. Um, like this, you know, like the size of, it's like the, the diameter of, a, of the quarter. And they just, they pull it over and they make a, they make like a tunnel. That's how you can make your, your and that's basically what you're looking at here. And there are websites you can go and buy hoops on, uh, there's gardener supply, they're expensive. So nine inch gauge galvanized wire, it's pretty thick. What you can do is just cut it to the width, the length that you want. I mean, go online, there are many resources and tell you how to do it. Google it, how to make home DIY hoops. Uh, you can do that and um, you'll see how easy it is to do. You stick it in the ground, you throw the row cover on and that you call it a day. I think that's it. And so resources that I have for you that I really recommend, uh, really, I will tell you, honestly, I took most of my planting information, what the site and the soil and the spacing, all from Johnny's. You can look up any plants in there and it will give you all the information that we just talked about. Bedco Seeds is also great for things like planting schedules. The schedule they have, they have one for herbs, flowers, and uh, and um, vegetables. And they will tell this, that Fedco has that, those, those PDFs, you can download them, you can carry it with you. Um, and it'll tell you when to plant it, um, how far to plant it, whether to transplant it or direct seed it, and up when you should do that, um, how to thin it, how much thinning, how much space each plant needs, the row spacing. Um, but it just bear in mind it's Maine. And Fedco is located in Maine, so they're in a different zone. So you can fudge things a little bit. If it says direct plant by blah, 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 
you know, it's going to be later for us. If it says you can start in Mar in, in April, we could probably start in March. So just bear that in mind. High mowing is great. They have all different kinds of resources on there. They've got things about quick and easy vegetables to grow. So these are just a couple of resources that you can use. I order seeds from all of these places. They're really good. If you, your library, your seed library has all of these seeds. I'm pretty sure of it. I mean, they did one last time I checked. And you can just go to your seed library if you're a middle country public library card holder. Go to the adult reference desk. The seed library is right there. Uh, I think Samantha can tell you more about that. And certainly uh, there's seeds that you can check out every month. I'm not sure how many you can check out a lot. That is correct. I believe it is four seeds per month per card holder. Four packets per month. Terrific. That's terrific. It's great. You could try anything. Um, and that's pretty much my presentation for tonight. I hope I gave people some, some insight into how easy it is to grow these vegetables um, and you'll give it a try. But um, if you have any questions, this is the time to ask. I guess I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so I don't, I don't think there's any questions. Is there, are there, Samantha? I don't okay. see any questions. So if there are no questions, I would like to thank everyone for coming to Gardening 101. And thank you, Regina, for helping us out today and teaching everyone about gardening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I hope, I hope you're not intimidated. There's so much information out there. It's uh, so easy to really grow. Things want to grow. That's my mantra. And it's really true. Um, really, really think it's